there is this, um, I don't want to call her a philosopher because she's not, a philosophy professor with a PhD who came up with a remarkable insight, you know, kind of like those, uh, you know those bands that are one-hit wonders, that they come up with like the one great tune, like, you know, like uh, My Sharona, I forget the name of the band, but you know what I'm talking about, like, they came up with the one great tune, and you never heard from them again, unfortunately. Yeah, well, this uh, philosopher, um, Gillian Russell, she came up with a concept that was so brilliant, so brilliant in its simplicity and its insight, you know, but, you know, sometimes some people just have, like, the one idea. And her one idea was epistemic viciousness. Epistemic viciousness. Now, it's not viciousness from being a vicious person, from being a, 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 a cruel person, but rather from vice. Somebody who has a vice, who is vicious in that regard. And epistemic, of course, is the adjective of epistemology. And by the way, it's not epistemological. Whenever you hear anybody say epistemological, okay, and trying to sound smart, know that they never studied philosophy and never studied epistemology, okay? It's epistemic. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, um, oh, a little note, notice came up on the computer. Anyway, um, epistemic, epistemology, uh, epistemology is theory of knowledge. It's how you know things. Mm -hmm. The current standard model is the, um, the Gettier model which is uh, justified true belief. That's pretty much the standard model at this time. It, it changes over the decades and centuries, quite frankly. But, you know, for the time being, that model is good enough for us. We're, we're not really diving into epistemology, even though it's epistemic viciousness, but rather something else, the vice. It, it, it's, it's really interesting. So, G uh, Gillian, I don't know if it's Gillian or Gillian, but Gillian Russell's essay, was called Epistemic uh, Viciousness and the Martial Arts. And she was saying how um, there had been a revolution in the 90s among, the, um, among martial artists. Because what had happened was that during the 90s, you know, all of a sudden you had uh, mixed martial arts came on the scene, right? And there, before that, you know, and I was a karate kid during the 80s, so I know what I'm talking about. Before that, there had been all these martial arts that had taught stuff. You know, karate, taekwondo, etc. And in these martial arts, you know, you were, once, once you became a master, you were supposed to be so invincible that no one dared mess with you. That was the promise sold. And I remember very clearly taking my karate classes and doing exactly what my son said said I ought to do, you know, and um, a couple of times I got into fights in middle school and it didn't quite work out. I, I actually applied what I learned in my karate class, but it didn't really work, I remember, <laughs> to my embarrassment, right? And so, um, but, you know, I thought, oh, you know, it's, I'm, it's me. It's me. I'm, I'm not doing it correctly, right? I use my karate moves and shit and some... <laughs> some hallway fight and I, I, it wouldn't work and so I just you know be reduced to just like uh, you know wrestling and throwing myself at the at the um, the other little kid or whatever you know I mean it was like I mean, you get the point you know the, the whole karate shit didn't work at all mm -hmm. and so you know the the idea became you know well, well I, at the time I didn't think anything of it but Gillian Russell pointed out that during the 90s, with the advent of mixed martial arts, all of a sudden a whole bunch of people realized that you know, these, these martial arts like karate and taekwondo and all the rest of it, you know, they, they didn't do shit. <laughs> it was just a bunch of hooey, right? It didn't work where it was supposed to. It's, it's in the name, martial art. You know, you're supposed to be able to, uh, to, to, to beat up your opponent. With the, with the karate moves that you know or whatever, right? And, uh, well, you know, it wasn't working out that way. These MMA fighters, they were basically using a combination of wrestling, jujitsu, and, and grappling, and whatever else worked, okay? It was just a hodgepodge. I mean, you could think of it really as like a ratatouille 
of, of uh, fighting disciplines, whatever work, just throw it in the pot, boil it up some and see what happens. And it's probably going to be delicious. And it was, you know, MMA fighters, you know, obviously, right? But what happened was that all of these Aikido, karate, Taekwondo, and all the rest of it, they failed miserably. They failed absolutely miserably. And in this essay, Gillian, and, uh, Gillian Russell, rather, uh, says how, you know, what, what was going on was that they were in this enclosed bubble. The, 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 the karate teachers, the, the martial arts teachers, they were in this bubble. And they weren't getting any external input. And so, of course, they were developing these vices of epistemology, of theories of knowledge. Remember, theory of knowledge is how you understand the world around you, how you know about it, okay? And so the, the point of the term epistemic viciousness, of, you know, a vice of epistemology, was that you were not getting input from the rest of the world. And because you weren't getting input from the rest of the world, you were starting to believe all kinds of crazy-ass theories that had no correlation with reality. There's a fa famous line um, that says that, uh, in theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there is. The revolution of mixed martial arts during the 90s proved this, proved that, you know, between the theory of these, you know, esoteric martial arts like karate, taekwondo, aikido, whatever, between that theory and the reality of mixed martial arts, of really going out there and fighting and seeing what works and what doesn't, there's a huge difference. There's an enormous difference. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, I, I suspect that uh, Gillian Russell uh, failed as a philosopher because right in her essay, she realized that if she expanded on her essay and her idea, a very, very good idea, and, and carried it forward, she would realize that her own profession, philosophy, was just full of shit. No different from these uh, senseis who were teaching karate and taekwondo and, and the rest of it. All of these martial arts that had zero effectiveness in the real world, right? And that had been the victims of epistemic viciousness. They'd fallen for the vice of a hermetically sealed, just totally closed off environment of theory that had no correlation with reality which is exactly what's happened in philosophy, which is exactly what's happened in just about all of our society. You start looking at, uh, for instance, you know, the, the politics, right? I, 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 because of the war in Ukraine, right, I've been, you know, getting up on a lot of political theory, and so much of it is just completely divorced from reality. Just completely divorced. There are like these schools of philosophical thought, of, of political science thought, and, and they say, oh, Putin is doing this, but why is he doing this? Because it doesn't fit our theory, so he should be doing this other theory over here, and I'm really this kind of theorist. And you're like, what the hell are you talking about, man? In this conflict between Russia and, frankly, the rest of the West, what's going on is that Putin is trying to maximize the advantage of his country, you know, moment by moment. He doesn't have any grand theory. He's just figuring out, well, this move might make it better for us. So we'll do this. And oh, over here, we'll do this. And of course, it contradicts these theories. Because all of these political philosophers, all of these political thinkers, the, these thinkers in terms of foreign policy and all the rest of it, they're captured by epistemic viciousness. And it's the whole society. Gillian Russell would have been a major philosopher if she'd taken this very simple insight, which she wrote about in the paper, and I'll, I'll, I'll link to the paper below, and expanded it. And even as you read the paper, it's obvious where the directions lie for very fruitful future research and writing about this particular topic. And she could take this, she could have taken this critique of what was going on in the martial arts and applied it to philosophy, the study of philosophy, which has com become completely discombobulated from reality. I know that because right now I'm in the middle of writing a, a philosophical project, but also in the other aspects of our society that are so important. Do you know why the United States is not going to get involved in a war with Russia? They're not going to get involved in a war at all, and they want to avoid it at all costs? Because, you see, the uh, Pentagon... 
The Pentagon is like that um, the, the dojo of the 70s and 80s that was teaching their martial art. And they've gotten a good look at somebody who's actually doing MMA. And they're realizing that they'll lose. That all their theories would be shattered and destroyed if they went up against the Russians. The Russians would annihilate them. No different than when you see these videos of MMA fighters going up against some martial art, uh, 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 you know, expert, some sensei of something, and just beating the shit out of him in about three seconds, you know. And these guys, right, they, they, these, uh, these, these martial art gurus, right, claim that, you know, they just, like, look at you with their tie or kai or ki or something, some Asian word, right? They'll just, like, stare at you and just, like, look at you and, and you'll die. <laughs> And they'll just stare at a, at a locomotive coming at them and just raise their hands and stop it. <laughs> and you're like, what the hell is going on? And the thing is, see, I remember in the 80s, man, when I hear my sensei, you know, riding, you know, you know, winding us up and telling us that once we got to be really, really good at karate, there was, we were practically invincible. And we believed this shit. And, you know, Gillian... Um, Russell, in her essay, she talks about her own experience in that regard. She fell for that same scam, too. And the funny thing is that probably those uh, sensei masters, those karate masters, martial arts masters, whatever the hell they were, right? They probably believed their own bullshit, too. See, because a, a lot of people say that, oh, they, they were you know, con men. They were trying to crook people. No, 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 no. See... The con man is aware that he's doing a con, and so he's always thinking of how to get as far away as possible once, once the game is up, okay? But when you truly believe something foolish, you, you, you think that you're in the right. And all of these uh, sensei, and all of these masters, and all of these experts, experts in medicine, and geopolitics, and the military, and all the rest of it, they have no intention of running away. Because they think that they're in the right. That's why it's a vice. It's a viciousness. They have been so closed off from reality, from the world, that they don't understand what is happening. And that's something that I've been trying, struggling, quite frankly, to understand. Why are all these experts getting things so consistently wrong? Why is it that some loser like me is more on the ball about what the hell is going on than all these guys with PhDs in foreign policy and all the rest of it. What's going on? It's epistemic viciousness. It's being sealed off in theory and having no interaction with reality. In fact, avoiding interaction with reality. Because, you know, all of these uh, 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 sun size, all these martial arts masters, as soon as they realized what was going on with MMA, they stopped doing these videos of them trying to fight MMA fighters and sealed them off, themselves off even further. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm very worried about. I was going to say I was kind of worried about. Actually, no, I'm terrified that this is going to happen, that more and more of the elite groups in the West are going to seal themselves off even further from reality. And so once the, 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 um, the battle comes, they will be so fragile and so disconnected from reality that reality will annihilate them utterly with, with just a little flick of the finger. Mm? And that's what happens. You know, another... Uh, uh, a guy who came up with the, the notion, uh, Nassim Taleb, right? I mean, an arrogant shithead, real, real annoying fuck, but a smart man. And he came up with very good insights. And anti-fragility is one of them. See, uh, the notion that there are uh, uh, fragile systems that uh, can break down at, at, at just a flick of a finger. There are robust systems that, you know, that they are built strong very armored, and there are systems, anti-fragile systems, that the more you pressure them, the stronger they get. And we know that, for instance, our own muscles and, and skeleton. Yeah? The more we pressure our muscles by exercise and all the rest of it, the stronger we become. An anti-fragile system is what we should be striving for. But what has happened is because of the epistemic viciousness of our elites and of our entire society, quite frankly, we have become fragile 
extremely fragile. And our society could potentially collapse very rapidly with just, like I said, just a little flick of the finger. It's not going to take much. And it's because of this. It's important to understand why this is happening. That's why I'm doing this video. See? And it's, under, it's important to understand the, the, uh, the philosophical underpinnings that has led us to this fragility that we are experiencing. I mean, look at our society. Look how fragile it is. If you say the wrong thing, people have, throw a complete hissy fit. They, they are so fragile in their thinking that they cannot contemplate somebody being a little bit deviant or thinking slightly differently on a particular issue. They have a complete hissy fit. And what happens? We go quiet. We say, you know, it's not worth it. Or, you know, I'm afraid for my job or my reputation. So, you know, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to say anymore. Or many times, often as not. You refrain from saying anything to begin with because you know what's coming. And this is what creates epistemic viciousness. There's no challenge. Nobody is challenging the bullshit. And because nobody is challenging the bullshit, the system becomes more and more fragile. That's basically what is happening to our entire society. Our society, which was once very robust, very strong, very anti-fragile. Well, it has become extraordinarily fragile because of epistemic viciousness. If you understand this concept, I think a lot of things will become clear. And it's a pity, like I said, that uh, Gillian uh, Russell didn't develop this further. But of course, it's understandable why. She got a PhD from uh, Princeton University in philosophy. She wanted to get in, like a nice job, a tenured job. And I, you look at her CV and she's done very well for herself, but of course she's been done very well for herself by never questioning her own field. She herself has fallen for epistemic viciousness because at some fundamental level she realized that if she questioned anything, she would be excluded. And her fear of being excluded is why she didn't develop this very, very good theory. It's why she is a minor one-hit wonder in terms of philosophy instead of a major thinker.